Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Peter has come from Austria by train to be with us today, and we are extremely honored. He is now heading the a section of the IEA Task Force number 18 on resilient cooling. So he's a, a world leading figure in this field. He's an engineer, he's an architect, he's a teacher, he's a designer, he runs a consultancy, he is the most amazing multitasker, and he's designing some of the most brilliant <laughs> buildings in the world. So over to you, Peter. Sue, so thank you so much. Uh, most charming, and not everything is true what you tell about me, but thank you so much. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for letting me be with you. I hope I can meet Sue's expectations. In fact, yes, I'm an engineer. I'm a trained mechanical engineer and, and lived a, a professional life in the field of buildings. When my teachers wanted to tell me how to do power plants, I was more interested in solar stuff and, and heating systems. So the, I, I disappointed my teachers, but I'm happy with this career. Um, 15 years of my life I spent at university uh, doing postgraduate courses for both architects and engineers, since we think that architects and engineers should be trained together and should be worked together. And, and yes, this we did in postgraduate stuff. And now I'm running two companies for, for my researcher heart. I have a private-based research institute. And for my engineer's heart, I have a company for building physics and HVAC design. And in my, in my, what I want to share with you will be very much a mixture of both worlds. And yes, and, and besides, I'm honored to, to lead the, the IEA Annex 80 Resilient Cooling of Buildings. So I'm happy to be in this community. If, if we find time to talk about this, I'm, I'm very happy. What I'd like to share with you today is, as I said, a mixture of, of my of, of, of um, uh, scientific basics and practical outcomes. I, I have to share my situation coming from a, a cold, uh, a cold um, moderate climate, which is changing now to a, to a warm and hot moderate climate. Yeah. So one, I'd, I'd like to share my experiences in, in a changing climate. And then I, I'm in the situation of, in Austria, we, we have been trained that it's a very good idea in our climate to use the potential of thermal mass and night ventilation. That has been a traditional way of, of answering our, our, yes, our, our conditioning of, of indoor rooms for centuries. And at least in the cities, uh, this chance is now not going away, but it's shifting to spring and autumn times. But in, in hot summer, we have to have other answers. I Before talking about cooling, I think we must talk about solar shading because it's a shame to, to go for cooling before we have done our homework in solar shading. And then I'd like to share um, outcomes and, and recent developments in the residential sector with cooling with radiant surfaces, which is a which is a big hope in our area today. We are talking very much with our with our builders if we should change to a cooling climate. You know, in Austria we have um, been used to permanent frost in December and January. We have design temperatures in winter of minus ten and minus fifteen degrees. That's traditional in our area. We talked about heating and never about cooling. And now it's changing very much. The design temperatures in winter, the, the frost events in winter are rare. When I was a child, I went skiing in the in the hills around the town. You you don't find snow anymore in the hills around Vienna today. And and yeah, heating is, is a minor problem. We we're in the point where we think about redesigning our, our thermal in, insulation levels. We, you know, Austria was a front runner in the passive house movement. We, we fought for 40 centimeters of insulation and crazy stuff like this. Nobody's talking about things like this anymore in Austria. So, but cooling is hitting the, the mindsets and we discuss a lot if it's luxury or if it's crazy or it's HVAC driven or if it's necessary already. I'd like to share with you this graph. It's the mean monthly outside ambient temperatures 
which are in our standards, which we design our energy calculations for. So it's the it's the it's the mean monthly outside temperatures where we do our energy passes with. And the lower line is what we have been traditionally trained to use until I think it was 2019. We used the lower curve. Then our experts said, well, climate is getting hotter. We should use the, the upper curve. Still nice climate, a mean temperature in August of 20 degrees, a mean temperature of January slightly lower than frost. This is what we do now. This is what we design our houses for. But if we look at observation, it looks like this. This was the year um, 2021. And when we listened to Ellen and learned about the plus 1.4 or plus 1.7 shift in average temperature, and Ellen said it, the land will be shifting more and the continental areas will be shifting even much more. And what we already have is from observation, a shift by four degrees easily during the summer month, a shift of three degrees easily in the winter time. And if we make up our minds, is this only a one year event? No, it's not a one year event. It's a trend. 2020 looked like this, extreme hot February. And as I said, snow is going away. And if we look back in 2019, it's like this. And not by mistake, I, I shifted, I tilted the arrows because it's okay to think, well, it's hotter then. But from my point of view, I don't have a feeling for saying, how does it feel two degrees more? What is this? And I tried it this way. I said, the January of today is like the February of my childhood. And the December of today is like the November of my childhood. So I can understand in my simple mind, I lost the January and the December of my childhood. They are not there anymore. We don't have to design for them because they stopped to exist. And I think this is a, a way that we can transport and explain what's happening. I have no way to explain what's happening from June to August. I can only look at other climates. And that's what, what the designers do very much now, look at climates where it is already like this and learn from their design, at least learn from their designs before the time of air conditioning, because after air conditioning, they, they stopped designing properly, didn't they? So this is a way of looking what happened. And you know this comparisons, how the climate will be and, and where's, the, 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 where's the climate which we face. For in Vienna, we say we face the climate of Athens or we face the climate of Cairo. So something like this, this is our mindset now. We have to look there to learn how to design. Another way to look, I, I calculated or I, I just took the, took the data from the cooling degree days and I took Rome and I took Vienna and did the time scale. It's 1979 to today. These are the cooling degrees days to a basis of 24, 21 degree in numbers of Kelvin days per year. And I quite romantically took 1985. This was the time when I finished, what is it in English high school? When, I, when I'm 18 and finished school, it's high school. So I finished high school in 85 and went south, we went to Athens, but we could have go to Rome. And the Rome of these days was even cooler than the Vienna of these days. So if you look at the cooling degree days of Rome, slightly less than 200, if you look at the cooling degrees days of Vienna, above 200. So what, what we learned to be south in our, in our childhood is now north. So, and, and if I'm asked by builders, should we think of cooling? I say, well, have the Romans have, uh, should thought of cooling 20 years ago? Yes, maybe. So I think the answer is yes, we have to face cooling even in Central European moderate climates because they are changing so fast. And when I talk to climate experts, 
and even more to standardization guys, they're always behind. The climate experts, not because they are not thinking quick enough, but because they are in most cases so shy, they say, give me a 30-year observation phase. Give me, give me statistical valid data. But with we we do not we do not design for a statistical valid data of a of a climate period of 30 years ago. We have to design for the next 30 years. So it's really at I love the meteorologists, but they they are so careful, scientific that they tend to to make the problem smaller than it is in most cases. And the brutal thing is the standardization guys. They are they're always 20 years back, aren't they? I'm one of them. Thermal mass and night ventilation. I, I really love night ventilation. I love thermal mass, but I, I love to make things easy and I did it easy like this. Sorry for all who, no, I, I think we can do it easy this way. Um, first thing, if we, and this should be a room. This is what a, a mechanical engineer thinks. It, it's a nice drawing of a room. Um, if we go for night ventilation, first thing, we have to allow our indoor temperature to be a little bit higher than, than usually. So night ventilation with a constant cool room is nonsense because the room has to get warmer to get it cool during the night. From my point of view, I think that 27 degrees in summer would be a nice achievement. I learned from Fergus and Sue and other front runners of adaptive comfort that it depends very much on outdoor temperature and many things more. So I know that 27 is, is quite, a, quite a low number. It could be 32. But let's start with 27. If we allow our room to be at 27, um, mass, thermal mass will do its job as long as the wall temperature is significantly, let's say, two Kelvin lower. If then, then it will take up heat, it will take up heat, and I calculated it against a uh, treated floor area of a characteristic room of, of something like three to three times four meters. So it's a characteristic exemplary values um, re relative to the treated floor area. So the, the walls could take up 70 watt hours during a day and to make them release this heat during the night, we have to be sure that it's again two degrees lower in the room during the night. And to get the room temperature two degrees lower than the wall temperature, we have to rely on an outside ambient temperature that is again roughly two degrees lower. And these three times two degrees are really from my calculation and observation, quite a robust um, estimation. Take the outside air temperature during the night and be sure that with a good window design, with a good solar shading design, with a thermal mass exposed to the room's air, you can manage to keep the room temperature six degrees higher than the outside temperature. This, so room temperature minus six gives the outside temperature during the night that you need or the other way around, the outside temperature that you have can secure a room temperature six degrees higher. And this is quite a, a str strong rule and it's valid only if you, if you open the windows to 10 air changes or something like this during the night. And you know, if you are living in urban areas, then in hot summer, at least in our area, to have really a night temperature of 20 or 21 is not always the case in hot, brutal summers. So in Vienna, we have always already nights where at midnight, we still have 26 or 27. And Manuel working in Africa will, will tell me that, this, that this, there are parts of the world where you can add 10 and 15 degrees above this. So... Night ventilation is wonderful as long as you have cool nights. If you don't have cool nights, you don't have cooling effect during the night or you have warm indoor rooms. One of this is necessary. And uh, before working with the IEA Annex Resilient Cooling, I had the honor to work with Per Heiselberg and other researchers 
on the annex of ventilative cooling. It was the 62. Velux was in, uh, involved and, and many others. And we, we, we faced this, this effect and we, we, we investigated mechanical solutions for ventilative cooling or mechanically assisted solutions for ventilative cooling. You know, we engineers always try to make things better and more complicated with, with opening the windows and shutting the windows and everything. And you start with a low-tech solution and, and then you end with annoying uh, influences like this. Start with a design of a building for natural ventilation with may, maybe mechanically operated windows. And then you get to those guys who talk about insurance. No, the insurance companies are very keen about stopping their contracts when you have a, 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 a night ventilated building because they say not only the air will come in, but the, but the bad people will come in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you, you have to face nasty things like driving rain and storm, like burglary, like in intimacy, like insects, noise, and dust. These are all the small small prints when going for night ventilation in, in city areas. And, and I did some buildings with night ventilation in city areas, and, and I know that it's, it's sometimes getting really complicated and expensive. Uh, maybe we have to make it simple again, but, but some, some standards, codes, um, laws are against it. Maybe we have, we have to change the laws. Yes, this is my, my word on, on thermal mass and night ventilation. Wonderful thing, but this is one of those wonderful carpet plot diagrams where you have to look three times at them. It's from, from a small town in Austria, or they, they would kill me for saying small town, but it's, it's, it's a small town. And the, the first one is for the period of 1954 to 2018, an average out of that period. The second one is younger, 2004 to 2018. I like the WeatherSpark climate database. I, I found it recently. They are, uh, they are courageous in presenting stuff. I hope they are good. Do you know them, Ellen? The Weather Spark. They have wonderful graphs and they say they are accurate, but I never met them. Um, to read this uh, from left to right, there goes the year. From bottom to up, there goes the hours of the day. And just looking at the, at the temperature scale, you can easily find out that the late evenings, which is this area, the late summer evening, just look by color how the late summer evenings have changed from statistically relevant lower than 18 or at least lower than 22 to statistically relevant never lower than 18 anymore. And sometimes, and not only sometimes, but often um, in the range up to 26 so you see by, by one glance how this late evening situation, which is very much important for the night ventilation effectiveness, um, has changed, and the early morning hours the same. I said I won't talk about cooling before I have talked about solar shading. And with solar shading, I'd like to make it very simple again, because in every uh, real design when talking with architects, designers, building physicists, builders, they come up with, with a glazing type, they come up with a shading style, they come up with a window opening and, and there's a big fuss with variables and, and everybody is talking about everything. And, and I, when I start working with them, I come up with this simple, brutal formula and I say, please accept this simple, brutal formula and then Feel free again to change everything, but at the end, look at the outcome of this brutal formula. I say them, solar shading and solar heat gains are driven by a multiplication of only four factors. The first is the G value of the glass, so the solar heat gain coefficient of the glass. The second is the shading effect from your shading system. The third one is the question, how big are your windows? 
So the factor, the proportion of the windows in the facade, this is the trying of a drawing of a big glazing, of a semi-big glazing and a small glazing. And with natural shading effects, so the shading effects of buildings, of overhangs, of fins, maybe of trees, these four factors, multiply them together and look at the outcome. And in our area, and this is for sure true, a very robust number for our Central European area, I am always happy and I know that the building will behave decently if this multiplication is lower than 5%. When they accepted this, they first tried to kill me and say, well, 5%, that's nonsense. 5% is just make up your mind. This is only 5% opening without glazing. Are you crazy or what? And then I show them example and we recalculate, find buildings with 5%. And then I let them work because the architects can work with this. The building physicists can work with this. The HVAC guys take the sun shading. Everybody is responsible for something. And at the end, they have to agree on a solution that is lower than 5%. I love this very much. And, and it gives them freedom again. At the beginnings, they, they really kill you if you come with this. And I look at buildings, at real buildings. And I took a very prominent place in the heart of Vienna. You see our St. Stephen's Cathedral in the background. And it's the same buildings, four generations of the same building in, in, in a stretch of 300 years. And the first building, uh, you see um, maybe a facade, a glazing proportion in the facade of 30% or something like this a single pane glazing with 80% solar heat gain coefficient, um, outside, outside shading with a shading factor of 20% and no overhangs. And it's, it, it results exactly in a, in a 5%. So they, they knew already. Uh, when they changed in the Bohemian epoch, they, they had a significant higher uh, solar heat gain coefficient total re, uh, referred to the facade, but it has to be said it's a retail building. So they were very fond of the idea to have big windows and, and have really retail. They did not give a damn about um, solar shading. The, it was retail and representation. Then after World War II, it was redone because it was bombed down and they did it with another, again, it was already in the time of, of air conditioning, so they didn't give a damn about solar shading because they had air conditioning. And then it was redone in my childhood in a postmodernism crazy style. Some, some shiny reflecting glass, some, some windows facade, so crazy enough. Historic again today, historic after only 30 years. And the G total facade didn't go down. So you can see it's it's a realistic value and you and it really can be of help in the design. Um, answers, historic and modern answers with this value. Well, make up our mind or, or please decide on your own what is what is sensible and beautiful and what not. I'm very much in, in conflict with buildings like this, not only because they are standing on the, on the green meadow and using more space than they are allowed to do. So I, I'm very much frustrated with these single family homes that, that say I'm green. <laughs> they are never. And, and this idea to have wonderful south-oriented glazings as long as you has, have a Venetian blind this is green building tradition in, in, in my area. I have been trained for uh, the passive house community very much when, when, when for buildings like this. I, I think it's not the best answer. When I was cycling through Toscana this summer, I found in Arezzo facades like this, and they end up with a 5% G total easily. Uh, on the Lido Venezia, I, I found buildings like this from the 60s. And this is, in fact, the, the style of sun shading, which I like very much. And as I said, let's learn from the, from the climates that are already there, what we face um, in future. These roller shutters, which you can tilt, I like them very, very much. 
because they really have a good sun protection value. They still have a good ventilation opportunity, even if they are closed, and they give you a social view to the outside. You can look down and see the children and see the cars and see everything. So they are, they are blocking the sun, but they are not blocking the life and they are not blocking the ventilation. I'm, I'm very much fan of these roller shutters that can be tilted and they are not a new invention, but in, in our area, they have been swapped away by the Venetian blinds and I think they, they, they should come back. This is something I do not like too much. It's one of those unnecessary big office towers in Vienna, brutal glazing, no sun blinds, and still, still a lot of too much heat gains. Yes, these are the, the tiltable roller shutters. This is the modern expression. This is the 1930s expression. You see a, a steel frame with, which can be tilted. They can be made of, of wood, they can be made of aluminum, they can be made of everything. Now I switch, allow myself to switch to, to cooling. And we are working very much with this idea of, of radiative surfaces. Um, since we, our, heat, our heating demand is going down and the houses are getting better, we can heat with floors or ceilings. And since cooling is coming over the horizon as a need, we want to combine cooling and heating and radiative surfaces can do the job. We, we have to decide, should we go for floors? Floor is wonderful for heating, floor is not so good for cooling. Or should we go for ceilings, which is wonderful for cooling, but which is slightly problematic for heating, as we will learn this. So we have to decide on this, and therefore we did a lot of calculation and, and investigation on the strength and weaknesses of those systems. And the focus should be on what is the heat flux we can expect from these systems, what is the comfort level or the comfort limitations which we can expect from these systems, are there condensation risks, what about efficiency, durability, and repair friendliness of those systems. I learned from my friend Wolfgang Kessling, he told me first, remember these numbers and then you will be a good engineer. I, I remembered, but the, the standards, um, Wolfgang Kessling from Transula, another, another man of our family. Uh, when, when talking about how to heat and how to cool with radiant, radiative surfaces or with building surfaces, we know that we have to look at the, at the, at the factors for heat transmission at the surface. And we know that radiant uh, heat flux is indifferent to the orientation. It's always five watt per square meter and Kelvin or something like this. And that the convective um, uh, part is very much differing from the question if the, if the air stays on this level or if the air is moving away from this level. So heating with the floor will be done at, at the number of 11 watt per square meter and Kelvin cooling um, at the ceiling the same, and if you tilt it, cooling with the floor is much, not less effective, but you need a higher temperature difference between the room and the floor to get the same, to get the same heat flux. And it could be things like this, and I already uh, allowed myself to say if the surface temperature is 23, and if the room temperature is 28, then we can expect a heat flux from the ceiling of 55 watt per square meter, and we can expect a heat flux from the floor of 30 square, watt per square meter. And that's enough for a decently built building. If you need more, I think you should, we should redesign our building, at least in, in areas I live. When we look at comfort, and I'm, I'm shy to talk about comfort as long as Fergus is in the room or others of you, so I hope I, I learned enough from you. Um, when we talk about radiative cooling or cooling with surfaces, we have to look at the asymmetry of radiant temperature. 
And we have to look at the contact temperature of floors. These are the, the most crucial things we have to watch when we go for radiative heating and or cooling. I redraw the, the famous um, local discomfort chart of ISO 7730, giving the uh, percentage of dissatisfied, which have to be expected uh, from asymmetry of radiant temperatures for four different kinds of radiative um, cooling and heating solutions. In red, it's the warm ceiling. In blue, it's the cold ceiling. And in gray, it's the cold wall. And in gray, it's the warm wall. To be read like this, if you go for a warm ceiling and enter a radiant temperature asymmetry higher than four, you have to expect or uh, be aware of a percentage of dissatisfaction of 5% of the people. And strict ISO says design for this 5%. Then you're in category B of the ISO 7730 standard. And if you go for a cold ceiling, we are very much um, indifferent or happy with the cold ceiling. We could allow, according to ISO 7730, uh, Asymmetry of radiant temperature of even 14 degrees um, to, to enter a level of 5% of dissatisfied people. So we're very much sensitive against heat from above, very much sensi less sensitive from coolness from above. And, and, and sometimes I'm confronted with the question, but hey, are you crazy? The sun is hot and it's above me. And I say, yes, that's true, but the sun is so small and the big sky is very cold. So we're trained to the cold skies above our head and the cold skies give us evol evolutionary um, training for, for it's nice to have coolness above and not warm above. So, um, and a big warning, a big learning is that please never never misunderstand this asymmetry of radiant temperature as the allowed difference between the surface and the room. I, I have been in many, many discussions of designers. They said, oh, I understand, Mr. Holzer, I understand that the warm ceiling is allowed only to be five degrees warmer than the room temperature. No, that's not. It's about the asymmetry of the radiant temperature of the upper half and the lower half of the room. It's not the difference between the surface and the room. So never think that in a 22 degrees room, it's allowed only to heat with a 26 degree ceiling. That's not true. It can be much warmer because it's about the sum of the radiant temperatures above your head level and below your head level. So if you're sitting in such a room, and the facade areas are at room temperature and only the ceiling is warmer or colder, then it's a, it's a weighted average of the radiant temperature which is counting, and it's the weighted average of the radiant temperature below your head which is counting, and this difference has to stay between the limits, in these limits, and not the surface temperature against the room temperature. This is a a widely widely used mistake and it's important to, to correct this. And the sun again is a good example. The sun has a radiant temperature of six and a, six and a half thousand degrees. And we're really lucky that it's only so small in this in this angle, in this room angle, it's only a tiny spot. And the rest is the minus 10, minus 20 degree cold sky. And the mixture of both gives a nice radiant temperature above our heads. And you know from industry halls, they have these gas radiators, these really hot gas radiators. And as long as it's a small spot or like this light, then it's weighted with the, with the room angle and gives a nice average radiant temperature. So never be shy about the radiant temperature only of the surface. You always have to weight and mix it with the, with the average one. And Having said this, we know that a heated ceiling can be in a usual room of a usual size, can be heated up to 
six degrees more than room temperature without any comfort problems. So if we have a room of 22, we can easily allow ourselves a ceiling with 28. And we do this and nobody complains. And then we, we have a, a ceiling heat flux of 40 watt per square meter. And from the cooling side, there's no comfort problem any because we are so so robust against cooling from the from above. But if we change the uh, view and go to the floor and ask ourselves how hard could we cool the floor, then we come to the contact temperature. This is what ISO 7730 tells us. They say people start complaining in a range of the floor getting lower than 18 degrees or getting warmer than 27 degrees. I'm concerned about this 18, but Ole Fanger did his research with people wearing light shoes. They, he did not do his research with people wearing socks or nothing. He did it with people wearing shoes. So this 18 degrees floor temperatures, I, I think it's dangerous if applied to people, modern people running around with socks or something less in their flats. Um, Bjarne Olesen did research in, in the climate chambers of, of, of Copenhagen uh, many years ago, in the beginning of his career, and he, his research has been fed into ISO da, 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 13732. And he said that it, it's depending very much on the on the kind of, of floor, if it's, if it's carpet, if it's wood, if it's tessellated floors. And this research is valid for people without shoes, so with socks or barefoot. And he's coming up uh, that wooden floors should never be lower than 22. Tessellated floors shouldn't be lower than 28. So you can see it's depending very much from the type of floor you have if you can think that in a residential area, floor cooling is a good idea or not. I think in offices, floor cooling can be easily done because then you're in the world of wearing shoes. But in the, in the, in the residential area, it's okay un, unless you, you get lower temperatures than this. Having said this, there's the, another end and but. Uh, in the floor, the condensation risk has to be taken very serious. The condensation risk has to be taken always serious. And what I'm talking about, cooling surfaces is only valid for areas with a absolute humidity in the range of 15 and 16 and 17 gram per cubic meter of dry air or kilogram of dry air. So never play around with radiative cooling in the tropics. One Austrian architect did it for the embassy of Jakarta and he was, yeah, he learned a lot. He said, I, I do it the right way. I do passive house technology with radiative cooling, but I have a ventilation system with uh, drying the air and I'm safe. Yes, he was safe as long as the people didn't leave the doors open, but you, you should expect that, that people leave the door open because they should be allowed to do, shouldn't they? Um, talking building physics, looking at temperature levels, starting with a room of 27 summer situation up there, having, having um, pipes operated at 21 degrees, then you will find temperatures like this. And at least in our region, there will be no condensation risks. As soon as you start to operate the pipes with crazy 16 and 18 degrees, you will have a condensation risk in the floor. You will have condensation risks for wooden floors and, and really dangerous because you don't see it for years, but you will smell it then and, and, and it's really a problem. And I like this operation with only 21 degrees very much because it shuts off if the room gets cold. So I like the idea not to control like hell in the mechanical system, but to have a self-controlling system. If this temperature stays at 21 the whole summer long and the room gets down to 22, the, the, the cooling stops automatically just because of temperature differences. And this, this is how we operate our cooling systems. We run them for the whole summer at 21 degrees and 
and they they just shift temperatures and they stop cooling if if not needed. I'm always asked, is are those systems very energy efficient? And I say, well, those systems themselves have no idea about energy efficiency. A cooling system takes up this cooling amount and a heating system releases the heating amount. There's no efficiency in the, in the component itself, but those systems, those surface-related heating and cooling systems allow high temperature cooling and low temperature heating. And that can be a key for utilizing environmental heat sinks and, and heat sources very good. In the area of cooling, we, we have a lot of systems which are only run by free cooling. So only via heat exchangers and not via chillers. And for sure, this is then energy efficient, but the system itself, the, the, the radiant surface is not efficient or not efficient. We talk a lot about how to do them in construction, how to insert the pipes. There's this community which says, um, get it in between the, the steel of the, of the ceiling, because there is the, is the best place in, in thermal aspects uh, to, to have the highest um, utilization of, of um, heat storage effects. The other says, get it down even lower than the than the steel very close to the surface and this one says it's good for demolition because it's it's more risky to be demolished but if it is you can repair it in this case it's very tricky to repair repair these pipes if if you if you find a, a guy with a big drill and he 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 he, he drills a hole into it it's very tricky to, to get this fixed because the static guys, the, the construction guys do not like you to, to cut their steel. They say the steel is important, more important than your pipe. And, and if you try to fix it without cutting the steel, then it's really, really a thing. So I'm, I'm more fond already of these systems because you really can, can fix them. It's, it's a question ongoing. And another thing, we learned from building ecologists that um, you never should mix the hydraulic system with the static system. Here we mix it brutally. So we have to rely on the hope that those pipes will last as long as we want our buildings to last. So it's a, it's a structural question. The, the, the industry tells us they will last for 60 or 90 years because it's polyethylene and it's only run at 30 degrees and 20 degrees. So it will last forever. But what is after forever? We, we love many buildings which are 200 years old. We don't want these pipes to get 200 years old. So um, the, the simple answer is if the system is broken after 60 years, then climate change has changed in a way that we have to rethink our systems again and maybe add something on the on the on the ceiling or something else. So we have to rethink it then. I don't know if this is a sufficient answer. In our climate areas, I think it can be, but I know that this contradiction in the in the systematic ecological approach is still there. This is how it looked like when I was at university, the new building of the university. You see vertical fins, vertical fins um, um, shading the much too big windows and the, the piping prepared for, for the pressurization test uh, of, the, of the tap system, of the thermal activated building um, element system in the ceiling. And you see it was one of those types where the pipes were in between the steel. So this this kind of, of solution. And um, the building physicists decided only after fin finalization of the building that they had an acoustic problem and came up with this wonderful acoustic measures. And these wonderful acoustic measures have been mounted with, uh, with long steel um, drills. And for sure, on 10 places, they, they demol demolished the pipes. And there I learned that you cannot repair it. And, and as, a, as a strong measure, it was in my own office. So, so I, I lived then without cooling in this place. So the, the, the down-to-earth stuff. 
asking where the pipe should be. You can simulate with heat flux, with dynamic heat flux, you can simulate everything. The answer is it does not matter too much. A little bit better um, adjacent to the surface. How we do it then? So uh, this, this technology gives us very good options to have a balanced heating and cooling system. These are the heat um, heating demand situation of a modern apartment building in our climate. We, we design it with good heat insulation and get down to 25 kilowatt hours per square meter treated floor area. Without ventilation system, if we apply this um, cost flow heat recovery ventilation system, we will get down to 15 or something. Hot water is still the big issue. Hot water with its hygienic aspects, with its um, circulation stuff, blah, 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 is already in the same level of heating. And room cooling with this system of tap 21 degrees constantly through the pipes is, is delivering something like 10. On the other hand side, we have good old simple household electricity demand, which is already in the same level as heating demand. And I calculated the driving a private car on usual um, distances, and it's hell more than all heating and cooling together. And learning that the cooling should be climate neutral or has to be climate neutral. We do not want to run chillers for the cooling. Our system is put it by only heat exchangers into a borehole heat exchanger field, use the field to run a very efficient brine to water heat pump and deliver everything you need heating hot water by the heat pump. And since this field has to be balanced, and this is really a hard learning, it has to be balanced. Never use a big borehole heat exchanger field only on one side heating or cooling because it will change its temperature constantly. And it will, in, in case of only heating with it, it will frost down. So we have in Austria a, a project, a big project with, I think, 50 boreholes, and they skipped the regeneration during the summer and they had permafrost after four years, so they, they, they really shut it down. You, you have to regenerate it thermally. You have to find heat sources in the summer, which give you back what you have taken out during the winter. One of the buildings um, we consulted with was an office building on a not favorable site. It's, it's near the main railway station, so a loud situation on the other hand side of the building is the railway station, so it's loud. Um, it's dusty and therefore they have a mechanical ventilation system. The architect loved his windows. I think they are, they are too big, but he loved it so much and he did a efficient textile shading. Yes, he did. I, I would have designed it the other way, but I'm engineer, not architect. Um, these are the numbers. In that case, we, we have an office building, so even more cooling demands than heating demand, maybe as a reason of the windows. And, and the system is like this, floor heating and cooling, floor because it's an office, and most of the cooling is done, or really nowadays everything with the heat exchanger, recharging the, the, the boreholes, and the boreholes are taken as a source over the heat pump, sorry, it's German, um, to heat the house. And as a, as a exchange element, we have a, an air to brine heat exchanger too that can help us recharging the um, boreholes if needed during the summer, or that can help to, to extract heat during the winter if, if they have too much. This is the system for residential houses, which I think works very well. We are doing it now as a standard already. So a residential house with a heating and cooling from the ceiling in the residential area. I'm, I'm much more friend of this because of this condensation risk and because of this comfort risk from the floors. Again, a borehole heat exchanger field is feeding the heat pump for heating. The low temperature heat pump for heating is feeding the high temperature heat pump for domestic hot water. During the winter, we heat with this. During the summer, we cool with this, but only free cooling. 
And since I said we need recharging of the of the of the boreholes, we use as the very simple recharge in Austria, we are forced to have extract ventilation. Extract ventilation where the air is coming through leakages of the window or through um, um, artificial leakages through the windows, and the extract air has been released without use. Now we add a brine to air heat exchanger and use it during the winter already and during the summer even more to recharge our, our boreholes. So I think this is quite a robust system. You can decide if it's, if it's low tech or not. Sure, there's a lot of stuff. There's the tap system in the, in the uh, ceiling. There's the heat pump, another heat pump, a buffer tank. Um, uh, heat exchanger for the domestic hot water to have it hygienic and at lower temperatures than if it would be a totally central system. We have the borehole heat exchangers for, for 20 flats. We need eight of them. We have another small buffer tank and we have this extract ventilator. So you can say it's engineer's paradise or green building. You're free to decide. I think it's both. And we have PV for sure. Yes, that's it. And looking back at the at the Dubai Expo, this was our pavilion, our Austrian pavilion at the Dubai Expo. It's finished now. It was a, a very much from Arabic tradition influenced design without mechanical cooling in the all exhibition area with um, extract ventilation, with uh, natural ventilation, with with wind movement, with ceiling fans and thermal mass. It, it worked quite well and we were honored to do it. Yes, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't quite understand how you were both recharging and cooling at the same time on the ground array. Can, can you explain how the controls work? Thanks for looking close. We split the borehole system into two halves. We we take one half for the cooling from for one month, we take one half for the cooling and we charge the other. And then we, we flip so so that, that we do not do not have it in parallel. Thank you. Peter, can I ask you, do, do you run this um, through a sort of future climate screen? So do you test it against, say, 40 degrees centigrade outside or whatever you think might happen? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And, and it's robust. The recharging necessity will go down. So for the next 30 years, I feel safe that, that it's still more heating than cooling in our area. So this, this is robust. At the end, maybe we will have to release some of the cooling to the air if it shifts. This is why we, we always have an air heat exchanger added. Our big concern is humidity. We are not sure what humidity will do. And climatologists are not very sure about this. I have to say we face a constant rise of absolute humidity during long, hot summer periods. So when the heat wave is there for two weeks and for three weeks, absolute humidity rises. And this is the danger for our radiant cooling systems. Well, now we are used to, to 15, so dew points around 20 degrees. If we add some, some gram from, from living, we, we end up with 17. And then I'm safe with surface temperatures of 22, 23. But, but if humidity will rise, I will have to rise my surface temperatures, but I learned from adaptive comfort that's a good idea. If it's getting hotter, then we have to say goodbye for 27 and embrace the, the 28 and 29 and 30. So this, this is the answer, but, but humidity is our danger. Really brilliant, thank you. Um, coming from a historic buildings background and a physicist, when you have the traditional solid wall materials, they will take up a lot of that humidity and just release it again. That's so they get more bang for the buck on this as well. That's absolutely true. Um, and we are, we're so much in love with wooden elements in our buildings. And these wooden elements are my 
my concern if you if we you know if you put them constantly at uh, humidity is above 80 degrees they will hate this so wooden floors are very very often used and we have to take care about our wooden stuff yeah, yeah. hello uh, i want to ask uh, do you think this uh, radiative uh, comfort models are uh, valid also for outdoor spaces like for urban uh, outdoor spaces because uh, we work with uh, surface temperature in the outdoor environment with when uh, uh, the sun impacts the uh, different surfaces. And I don't know if uh, you think these, these models of predative uh, surfaces are valid also for this uh, outdoor environment that, that are uh, usually bigger and, uh, well, if they are different than indoor environments. Well, my careful answer is, is a clear yes, radiative effects are very much effectful in the in the outdoor spaces too. But in the outdoor space, there's good old sky, which is the dominant radiative effect that you have. And then there's the floor as the as the next radiator or re reflector. So I think in the outdoor it gets really uh, much more driven by direct sunlight much more driven by the radiative temperature of the sky and driven by the reflection of the of the surfaces during the day it's the reflection in the in the night it's radiation again not only for uh, momentary comfort but for um for radiative cooling back to the sky and in outdoor space i learned that it's the you have to take very much into account the evaporative effect of plants for sure, and the air movement. And, and if you mix that all together, I think the, the standard effective temperature is a very good model to, to, to include all this. So yes, it's about radiation, but it's about much more in the outdoor area. Thank you. Um, Peter, I'm very worried about the results and outputs of very limited laboratory studies. So we saw these work in the laboratories by Funga, on which standards are based, where you're looking at radiative asymmetry, yeah? Um, they don't take into account um, sort of different ventilation um, systems in that, that area. And I know from studying the wind catches of the central Persian desert, that you have very high radiative temperatures, but you have this cool breeze blowing through. Um, so, I mean, do, do, you, do you have concerns about the limitations of those laboratory studies? For sure, we are in the same family soon, yes. And, and thank you to all your researchers in the adaptive comfort world that you really went out and took, took measurements where the people worked and lived that really changed the game, for sure. Uh, I'm yeah, maybe I'm still trapped in this world of, of standardization. I, I'm used in my in my everyday business that I'm confronted with, hey, you're not obeying the standards. And uh, as a good engineer, you say, okay, I will calculate. So you can say, get, a, get rid of the standards. You could say this. And and I'm I'm very much in the discussion, for example, these buildings. Um, I, those buildings will not guarantee a temperature. So in the HVAC world, we usually want to guarantee a temperature. Those buildings never guarantee a temperature. It's better than nothing, but it's it's you cannot say if they will have 28 or 29 or 30 degrees. And having said this, those buildings are really experienced as free-running buildings. They are not experienced as HVAC buildings. And since they are experienced like free running buildings, there's no difference if the buildings has been building mass has been cooled by night ventilation or by hydronic system. The feeling is the same. So I, I really advocate the idea that those buildings can be treated with the adaptive comfort system and not with the classical comfort system. And having said this, yes, then we're in the world of air movement. Sorry to, to just one last Sorry, question. Last question. Yes. Um, I think you're already starting to, to answer it, but I would like to know how um, your model, the one on the screen now, compares to the passive house standard, and what do you think about the passive house standard? Well, well, the, the, the passive house standard was uh, the, driven by the idea that you can get rid of 
heaters, as soon as you get the energy standard for winter heat protection, so much down that you can heat only with the inlet air. That was the origin of the passive house standard, trying to get rid of the euro per square meter for the heating device and only heat with the inlet air that in the passive house world is already there. And then they came up with this crazy heat insulation and everything and with the air tightness of the building. Uh, I think it was a physical experiment. In, in some cases, it worked. I'm not too much friend of it today because they, they have uh, excluded a lot of aspects of a good building like inside outside connection like like terraces like blah 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 so this idea having windows to the south having it extremely compact no i don't like this simplification and for summer situation i think they have really caused some problems to honor them they they learned they they redone their standards today but they caused a lot of summer overheating problem with their with their term thermoskanne what is thermoskanne in english this, you know, this insulating bottles. The, 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 the Passive House guys sometimes told me, insulation is very good for summer because it keeps the building cold as the bottle keeps the, the water cold too and the tea and the beer. And then I always say, yes, but the bottle has no windows. So as soon as you have an insulated bottle with a window, it would get hot inside. And that is the problem with the Passive Houses. So you can do a passive house with good ventilation and with good summer performance, but, but they focus so much on insulation and air tightness that they caused some problems in the community. Thank you so much. Um, just one final thought. I was thinking about the building attributes that you're all um, filling out. One of my top building attributes is wet plaster finish on the inside of walls, which is so Robin in, reminded me, which is so um, effective with the water-based paint in absorbing and wet keeping plaster. a wet plaster finish, you know, like a plasterer. Yeah. Yeah. And that reduces, keeps indoor humidities very stable. So there may be lots of simple solutions out, of, out there. There are, we all use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a brilliant lecture and Peter's around all day. Um, it's time for tea and coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.